Hey, aloha. Welcome, everybody, to our March installment of our monthly Slice of PiCast seminar series hosted by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center, or PiCast. I'm Brad Romine. I'm the deputy director of our PiCast University Consortium. Um, this Slice of PiCast seminar series is intended to provide a platform for sharing ongoing and state-of-the-art climate adaptation research and science to management applications in Hawaii, the US affiliated Pacific Islands and beyond. This presentation is being recorded um, and will be available on our PiCast website under events if you wanna watch it later um, or if you wanna share it with anybody that's missed it. Um, for those joining us online, welcome. Uh, please keep your microphones muted during the talk. Um, there will be time for a question and answer at the end, both from our audience and online. Um, if you're online, feel free to type any questions into the chat along the way and we'll, uh, we'll get to them at the end or, or feel free to um, raise your hand virtually and unmute at the end as well. Uh, at the conclusion of our seminar, uh, please do complete a short survey that'll pop up if you're online. Uh, we, we use the seminar in helping to plan, future, we use that uh, survey in helping to plan future seminars. So please take a moment, brief moment to fill that out before you leave. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today, my friend and colleague, Dolan Eversoll, who will be sharing with us today about applying science to coastal management in Hawaii. Dolan is extension faculty with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant Program uh, here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's a coastal geologist by training and earned his degree in geology and geophysics right across the way in the Department of Earth Sciences. Um, somehow, he's also finding time at this point to also pr pursue and make progress in his PhD uh, in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning here at UH Manoa. Since, two, uh, since 2015, Dolan has served as the Waikiki Beach Management Coordinator um, in an advisory role through a partnership between Hawaii Sea Grant and the Waikiki Beach Special Improvement District, District Association. This position includes coastal and beach management, technical support, and policy coordination with local stakeholders in Waikiki. Dolan is very active in coastal management and community engagement island-wide, providing extension and coordination for a variety of coastal projects on Oahu and beyond. Through Hawaii Sea Grant, Dolan also served as the NOAA Coastal Storms Program Pacific Islands Regional Coordinator, coordinator covering the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands, and um, as a technical and policy advisor to the Office of Conservation of Coastal Lands in the Department, the State Department of Land and Natural Resources here in Hawaii. Dolan also draws from a lifetime of experience as a surfer and a paddler and was a Honolulu County uh, Beach lifeguard. Dolan also just completed his 20th year of service to the university. Congratulations, Dylan, and um, welcome, and thank you for agreeing to talk to us today. Thank you, Brett, Dylan, and Brad. Can I, sorry to interrupt, can I make one additional announcement before you get going? Of course. It's a little less about Dolan, it's a lot more about Brad, whose birthday it is today. Oh, wow. birthday, Brad. Years of service, or <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, Brad. Yeah. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that uh, great introduction. Exhaustive. I don't know if I could add any more to that. So, um, <laughs> thank you for that. And thank you for everybody for being here in person and online. Um, it's an honor to be able to um, contribute to this seminar, and I'm happy to share with you some of the work I'm involved with. Those that know me will be very familiar with some of the stuff I'm going to share, uh, but maybe there's a little tidbit or two that you haven't heard yet. Um, and those that don't know me are familiar with our work. Hopefully this will be enlightening to some of the work that we're involved with, um, particularly in Waikiki. So I'm going to give kind of a high level overview of the work I'm doing in Waikiki. And I wanna really highlight that um, research to application that Brad had mentioned is kind of one of the themes. Uh, I'm, I'm really focusing my presentation today on how we're using the information that is being produced for management of the coast in particular. So with that, um, I wanted to start with just a historical context of Waikiki. And this is critically important 
uh, to understand the history of Waikiki when we start to develop plans for the future. And you're going to hear a lot more shortly about what some of those plans look like for the future, but it's equally important to understand where it was um, in the not so distant past. So this image um, is uh, an image of what the historical streams looked like in Waikiki. And you can see those um, blue lines kind of bisecting Waikiki as we know it were the historical streams and the stream mouths that did enter the coastal system um, in Waikiki. And then you see the green, the light green shaded area there um, represents areas that were formerly wetland or marsh type environment. So the point here is that Waikiki is completely transformed from what it was 100 years ago or more uh, as a wetland environment into a dense urban environment. Uh, and that's an important context for what we might be thinking um, will happen in the future. Um, it's also equally important to understand the context of how the Alawai Canal transformed Waikiki into what we know it to be now today. Uh, the Alawai Canal was dredged in the early 1920s, 1921 to about 28 or so, and um, it allowed the drainage for Waikiki to occur. Equally important to the drainage of the area, um, it also served as a source of fill to fill in por portions of Waikiki that were low lying. So Waikiki was, um, like I said, a wetland, but it also had a lot of duck ponds and taro lo'i and things like that, that were subsequently uh, filled in in part from the dredge material that the Alawai Canal produced. Um, interestingly enough, some of you may have heard there was an original plan for the Alawai Canal to have two entrances, one next to the natatorium, the other at its current location at the Alawai Harbor. And here's uh, an image I found of what that um, plan had originally looked like to have a, an entrance and a channel uh, right next to the other side of the natatorium. Um, that was never completed, of course, and the Alawai terminates at Kapuhulu. Avenue where the library is, uh, but that was the original plan. So it's interesting to see what some of those concepts were uh, back in the day. Well, it's equally true that along the coast, we did a lot of transformation of what the shoreline looked like through shoreline interventions like these structures. And Cujillo Beach here represented in this image is a great example of that in that uh, a lot of people think that the structures that you see in Waikiki had this comprehensive vision and plan, and they were all built kind of with a plan in mind. That is far from the truth. In fact, many of the structures that you see, particularly the older structures you see in Waikiki, uh, were kind of built in an ad hoc nature at different periods of time. Um, you can see the Kapahulu groin at the bottom of the image there uh, was built in 1951. Um, soon followed by the breakwaters that we refer to as the slippery wall in Waikiki uh, around 1953. The northern side of Kuhio Beach, um, the first groin was built in the, in the late 1930s. And then there was other portions that were amended and rebuilt um, from there on. So point of this image is to understand that there wasn't really an overarching plan and a vision for Waikiki Beach and these structures. They were just trying even some semi-experimental methods to stabilize the beach, even back in the um, early 1900s. We can also look at uh, historical aerial photographs to understand the historical context of the shoreline. And this one, I just wanted to share with you, uh, Cohio Beach again in Waikiki. Uh, the, yellow, um, the yellow line there is the 1949 shoreline. Uh, and the red line indicates the current or uh, 2015 shoreline. And just notice the difference in the shoreline location, particularly in the diamond head cell or the right cell. You can see the two images, uh, the 1949 image above and the 2015 image below. And uh, it's just to suggest that um, it's changed quite a bit from its original configuration. And in fact, Waikiki, before we intervened and did all this, had very narrow, um, beaches that had a lot of uh, terrestrial material in them. They weren't these beautiful white sand beaches that we see now. They had a lot of um, uh, input from terrestrial streams 
and the streams that were inputting their material onto the beaches, but they were much narrower than what we've created now. Here's an image uh, from around mid-century showing a complete lack of any beach in Cujillo Beach and completely contrasts with what we see in the same image uh, in modern day. That's the same location. So we've um, committed to having sandy beaches where there wouldn't normally be naturally occurring sandy beaches throughout Waikiki. And so that begs the question of, is that the vision for the future? And I'll share with you some of that vision that we've been engaging the community in Waikiki on. Well, actually I'll just share with it, with it you now is in engaging the communities in Waikiki and the stakeholders uh, over a period of about four years, we've asked really specific questions about what should the future of Waikiki Beach look like? What areas are most valuable to you? What do you see as problems? What do you see as solutions? And we got really good feedback uh, from a group of stakeholders that were invited to participate in these meetings. And that in turn helped um, to develop the vision for the future of Waikiki through an environmental impact statement. So more engineering based solutions. But the overarching sentiment of nearly everybody that we talked to was, yes, we need beaches in Waikiki. Because that was the first question is, do we need beaches? How big do they need to be? And are they all equally large? And so those are more detailed uh, nuances to those questions. Uh, no, not everybody felt that every cell needed a huge wide beach. But we also are paying very close attention to the recreational uses of different portions of Waikiki. You might think of Waikiki as just one big commercial entity, but it turns out some areas are better suited for certain types of activities like canoes and things like that, whereas other areas, um, maybe not so much. So these community engagement uh, meetings were really important to develop the uh, designs that are, I'll share with you in a few minutes on what's going to happen in Waikiki or what's proposed for Waikiki. And then of course, the gorilla in the room is sea level rise, which is driving a lot of the design uh, for what we're going to be doing in Waikiki. And this extends not just on the shoreline, it extends into the landward portion of Waikiki, as you might expect. Uh, here's an image from the state sea level rise viewer showing the 3.2 foot uh, sea level rise exposure area, which is a combination of passive flooding, uh, high wave, um, annual high wave and coastal erosion, kind of the worst of all three. And you can see some areas of Waikiki are more um, vulnerable to sea level rise exposure than others. Um, but it's this type of information and this type of data that is driving the need to redesign and rethink uh, what Waikiki might look like in the future. So sea level rise is definitely a major influence on our conversations about land use and beach management in Waikiki. And that's true all over the state, if not the world. So a little um, history of Waikiki here. I, I started with Waikiki being a wetland. It will eventually revert back to a wetland over time. Uh, but in the meantime, we're struggling to maintain beaches in Waikiki, which are thought to be critically important to the use and the economy throughout Waikiki. And here's just some images of what over the years, what um, some of the sections of Waikiki look like at their worst with complete beach loss in some places and other areas you'll see uh, wave inundation and um, exposure of infrastructure to waves. And um, these are the type of conditions that we want to try to mitigate uh, or prevent altogether, largely through um, maintaining a sandy beach in front of or on top of this material. So I mentioned that there is a universal sentiment of the need to maintain beaches in Waikiki. Um, the University of Hawaii was involved with the economic study to refresh a prior study that estimated the value of Waikiki Beach. And you can see the punchline there in yellow. I don't know if you can see it on your screens, uh, but it's estimated to be worth about $2 billion a year to the local economy. And that's just based on jobs and tax space. Uh, it doesn't even look at uh, natural resource or the inherent value of having natural resources, nor does it look at the marine side of the equation with storm mitigation benefits 
of the reef and the beach. Uh, so that I would argue that two billion dollars a year is an underestimate of the true, the true value of having a, a healthy and intact uh, marine ecosystem um, in Waikiki. So it's fair to say Waikiki Beach is extremely valuable and thus is a major driver for some of the uh, proposed efforts to maintain beaches in Waikiki. There's also uh, an important partnership and relationship that has developed over the last seven years in Waikiki. And there's a new, a relatively new seven-year-old uh, special improvement district in Waikiki. Uh, it is a mouthful it's called the Waikiki Beach Special Improvement District Association. And here you can see the boundaries of that district. It is Waikiki as you think of it, bounded by Kapahulu Avenue down the Alawai Canal to the Alawai Harbor and out 150 feet uh, offshore into the ocean off Waikiki. It's important to note that the boundary of this district does include uh, the Alawai Canal. So the boundary is on the Mauka side or the landward side of the Alawai Canal. And that's an important distinction because this improvement district is interested in things like improving water quality in the Alawai Canal because it is so connected to uh, the beach systems in Waikiki as well. Um, and it, this district is um, in partnership with the state DLNR embarking on some beach improvement projects. And the role of the university in this is to provide some of the data, some of the science, and some of the um, policy and technical support to help manage the beaches in Waikiki. And that's part of my role as an extension agent here at the University uh, Sea Grant Program. I serve as an advisor to this improvement district on um, all things Waikiki beach related. We're also taking a broader look at the entire watershed. So not just managing the beach uh, in a vacuum, but looking at this as a whole ecosystem and looking at the watershed all the way up to the top of the Ko'olaus on how we manage storm water, how we manage the uh, water quality in the canal uh, that ultimately can impact the beach itself. So it's an important component that ahupua'a wide aspect. Uh, so yes, there is a, a nice partnership that has emerged from this effort, um, including the state of Hawaii, primarily through the Department of Land and Natural Resources the University of Hawaii, um, largely through our Sea Grant program, but also the Climate Resilience Collaborative is an important partner among other units here at the university that are providing data and expertise to help um, sustainably manage Waikiki and its beach systems. And then of course, the Special Improvement District itself, among others, the city and county is also a partner in these efforts. So I mentioned the application of data in managing Waikiki. I could spend an entire uh, presentation just on that. So I'm just gonna touch on a couple of um, topics and data that is important in how we manage Waikiki Beach. And one of those is the historical shoreline erosion rates that, the, um, that has been produced here by Chip Fletcher and his group. Um, here's a, an older version of some of the his, uh, historical shoreline erosion maps. Really important to understand what the erosion history is and as we develop management strategies for different portions of Waikiki Beach. And this can be done through um, using um, aerial surveys and things like that that let us better understand the seasonal nature. So not just the long term, but also the seasonal nature to change in the beach systems in Waikiki. So that's some of the data that's being used that helps us um, develop models, conceptual models of where is sand going? That's uh, always an important question. If we're gonna be placing sand on the beaches, it's important to understand the transport pathways so that we can better manage and mitigate any potential loss of sand or unexpected um, sand transport. So here's a conceptual model that one of my colleagues, uh, Shelly Havel put together and recently and kind of a lot going on here, but those of you that know Waikiki Beach will be familiar with the channel that the catamarans use. That is a major conduit of se uh, sediment to transport in and out through that channel on and off uh, shore in Waikiki, along with uh, the dominant transport from the Diamond Head side of the beach down towards the lower port of, portion of the image. That's pretty well known now. 
we have very well quantified, um, at least conceptually, the transport pathways. And that's just a need to have constant maintenance to understand, constant monitoring to understand um, how much sand is moving when, that type of thing. So this is just an example of the conceptual nature of how we're envisioning uh, sand transport in Waikiki and how some of that data is informing that process. So I wanted to share with you just a few projects that we're working on in Waikiki, largely uh, beach focused, but the later portion of my presentation, I'm gonna share with you some of the work that we're involved with on the built side, on the landward side of the beach. So uh, a couple of recent accomplishments um, in Waikiki, they start around uh, 2019 with the construction of a sandbag groin in Kuhio Beach. This was meant to stabilize just a small portion of that corner of the beach that you might recall had a concrete foundation that was exposed. It was a real mess for a while. I, I had an image of that in that earlier slide with all the erosion patterns and the, the pictures of that. Uh, so that was built to mitigate some of the erosion occurring there, uh, followed by the completion of the Royal Hawaiian Groin in the year 2020. And that was um, a, a really great time to be doing that construction because it was during the COVID shutdown. There was literally no one on the beach um, during large portions of that construction period. So if you were to pick a time to do it, that was um, opportunistic that all the permits and everything just happened to come together right about that time. Uh, in 2021, uh, there was a beach maintenance that completed, and that placed uh, 20,000 cubic yards of offshore sand that was pumped up onto the beach, on, into the Royal Hawaiian Beach. I'll show you some images of that in a second. Uh, and then there's currently underway um, since about 2017 is a Waikiki Beach Improvements Environmental Impact Statement, and I'll share with you what's in that. That's an ongoing um, project that proposes some pretty ambitious new redesign of structures in Waikiki. All of which being informed by some of the work that many of us are involved with to engage the community in Waikiki and understand what their concerns may be. Uh, we've also been working on a living document as a beach management plan for Waikiki Beach. So this is meant to help develop um, kind of stakeholder, stakeholder driven management strategies for improvements and maintenance of the beach. Um, the management plan assesses kind of short, mid and long-term strategies for beach management and what different techniques could be used. Even gets into things like beach cleaning. How often should we be beach cleaning? What kind of equipment is best suited for that? What type of environmental impacts are associated with cleaning the beach? And I don't mean just picking up litter, but actual machines that um, kind of sort through and sieve the sand itself. Very common that you'll see beach cleaning um, throughout the world. Um, Waikiki is not unique in that way. So we have a management plan that is now in place. Prior to this, a few years ago, there was no management plan for Waikiki Beach, believe it or not. Um, our state's most important beach had no management plan associated with it. So we can now point to a management plan that will be continually updated for the foreseeable future. Um, this is kind of a pet project I wanted to share with you. It's kind of veering away from the science, but I think it's important in Waikiki because it does highlight the, um, the history and culture of Waikiki as a kind of a surfing hub. And there is an organization called Save the Waves that has something called the World Surf Reserve. And we're looking at applying Waikiki to be one of these world surfing reserves. There's actually 12 of them in the world. Here you can see I've listed uh, the different World Surf Reserves. You might recognize some of these names. They're typically very well-known surf sites <clears throat> that warrant uh, attention for um, one recognition that it's an important and valuable surfing site, but also in the process of going through the application for this, you have to develop a management plan and set up a steering committee, a stewardship council, they call it, um, to identify threats to the surf sites and then develop management strategies that address that. So I just wanted to share with you that the science informing the management plans goes beyond just how do we manage the sand, but how do we manage the entire ecosystem, the surf sites, the reef health, water quality. I talked earlier about the ahupua'a approach. So this is 
more in line with taking a broader look at um, recognizing the value of surfing in Waikiki. So other projects, getting back more into the beach and engineering side of it, uh, the Royal Hawaiian Groin, that was completed in August of 2020. Like I said, during peak COVID time, um, it cost about just under $2 million to build, which was actually um, underestimate of what was thought it would cost. And an important, I mentioned that partnership with the Beach Improvement District in the state, the Beach Improvement District has paid for 50% of these projects that I've presented so far. So it, it really is a public private partnership. Uh, I've heard from others, from people occasionally, how come the hotels aren't contributing to these projects? They're the ones that are gonna benefit the most. Well, in fact, they are um, through this improvement district. That district that I showed you the map of, of Waikiki, all the commercial properties in that district pay a special assessment, a tax, that goes into a fund that is meant to um, partner with the state and cost share projects um, along with the state BLMR. In addition to paying for some of my time as a university faculty member. <clears throat> the other project I wanted to share is uh, a recent beach maintenance project uh, that was completed in 2021. And that was done May, 2021. Took about four months to complete. And this involved uh, offshore dredging of 21,000 cubic yards of sand, pumping it into this settling basin you can see in the kind of lower right portion of the image in the Cohio Beach swim basin, pumped the sand in there, let, allowed it to dewater or dry out, and then it was put into trucks and hauled down into the Royal Hawaiian Beach, uh, kind of in the uh, upper portion of the image. So uh, an important project in that it was um, successfully done, at a cost-effective scale. And this is something that the plan moving ahead is to continue to do this on a, maybe a 10-year basis. Eventually that might even be more frequent than every 10 years, probably needs to be done on more of a five to 10-year basis. So just know that this beach maintenance um, concept to pump sand from offshore is kind of thought to be a recycling of sand. We know where the sand goes. It goes out into the sand field immediately outside um, the, the surf breaks in Waikiki, and we can continue to pump it back uh, relatively efficiently uh, on an ongoing basis. And this contrasts with the past practice in Waikiki, which was to bring sand in from other locations. Those days are over. Um, there, one, there really aren't any other sources of sand commercially available. We can't just go take sand from another beach, although we used to, um, but those days are long gone, thankfully. Uh, and there really aren't any other sources of sand that we would want to do that with. Um, but it's also been identified that the nearshore environment in Waikiki is super saturated with sediment. There's too much sand on the reef and in the nearshore. So rather than bringing more sand in and adding to that volume, the idea is to recycle it back to the beach on an as-needed basis. At least that's the plan looking ahead in the near future. So I wanted to share with you some before and after images. They're pretty telling. Uh, here you can see the Royal Hawaiian Beach before the placement and immediately after. I put in there that yellow dash line is the prior shoreline. So we about doubled the width of the beach in the Royal Hawaiian cell. <clears throat> Nearly all the sand was put into this beach cell as opposed to spreading it out um, outside of this district. Uh, and the idea being that we have a very good understanding of where sand goes in this area. And it actually goes out the channel to the left into a sand field. And that's the sand field that was dredged to bring it back to the beach. So that's, that's the Royal Hawaiian Beach maintenance. Here's another image after the completion of the Royal Hawaiian groin, kind of showing um, the full width of the beach. And um, it actually, I'm happy to say that it looks just like this today. It hasn't really changed much in large part because of that Royal Hawaiian groin has, um, it's a replacement for a prior groin that was um, failing. And it seems to be doing a really good job of stabilizing this portion of the beach, especially. So getting back to some of the um, monitoring, the need for monitoring of the beach is critically important and don't worry about all the details in here. You can ask me a question later if you want, but what I want you to take away from this is you might recall there was a record 
uh, south swell this summer. And those that surf will know that this was a, a truly remarkable swell uh, that hit in July of this year. And so there was an effort, um, thanks to Chip Fletcher and his group, to go out to monitor and map the beach before, during, and after the swell, or at least before and after the swell, um, to understand, well, was this swell an erosional event or was it an accretional event? It turns out it was a very large erosion event uh, gained about 1,700 or 1,700 cubic yards of sand from the event on the subaerial portion of the beach. Accretion, right? Did I say erosion? Yeah. Yeah. Accretion, sorry. Yeah. Very large gain. Yes, it was gained sand. Uh, so that was about 3% of the total volume was gained in one swell event. And that's something that I can tell you as a surfer and a former lifeguard, large swells in the South Shore tend to be more accretionary than they do erosional. Uh, they're not, uh, you think of big swells as being erosional, that's not always true, particularly in Waikiki. Uh, so we know now that that swell in particular uh, brought sand to the beach and probably from that near shore environment, we don't sure exactly where that sand came from, but we know once it's on the beach, uh, how much sand was produced. So I wanted to, transition into kind of the future plans, looking ahead into Waikiki's future. Uh, I mentioned before that one of the efforts that uh, is that partnership between the state DLNR and the Beach Improvement District is to develop an environmental impact statement for um, proposed projects in Waikiki. Uh, this is an ongoing effort. It's already um, in its draft phase. So if you're interested in understanding what's in this, um, you can simply look at this EIS and see what the four projects are, uh, but there's four separate projects proposed and two of which are just to continue with sand placement. Um, the other two projects that I'll show you in a second are to reconfigure the structures in uh, along the shoreline to make a more stable beach platform that can then be um, placed, sand can be placed in that system. Uh, there was an appropriation from the state legislature back in 2021 for $12 million. <clears throat> that money has not been spent yet because the EIS is not complete, so they can't authorize a project yet. Uh, $3 million of that $12 million is that um, private partnership match. So it's not 50%, but it's getting closer to it. Uh, there was also a $6 million additional request in this year's state budget, so we'll see if that sticks. Uh, this additional six million is because uh, what was thought was going to cost 12 million is now looking closer to 20 million to do some of these projects, at least the first phase of which. So we're waiting for the final publication of the EIS, the approval of the EIS. That is not an approval for the projects, but it's simply the environmental document that will be used for uh, to justify the permits for um, some of the structures that could be built or proposed to be built. So what are those projects? Um, here's the image of the four um, different cells that are being proposed for projects. The Fort Drusi cell is simply to back pass sand or move sand from one end to the other to kind of combat and counteract some of the erosion that's occurred at the Diamond Head end of the Fort Drusi beach. Um, the other sand placement is the Royal Hawaiian uh, beach maintenance, which I just shared with you. The plan moving ahead in, as stated in the EIS is to simply to continue to do that um, for the foreseeable future. And then the other two projects are to reconfigure the Cujillo uh, Beach, the EVA portion of Cujillo Beach breakwater with a segmented breakwater. And then the gorilla in the room is the most ambitious, of course, being the Holly Kalani Beach shell in front of the Sheraton, where there's three tuned tea head groins that are proposed to stabilize that area. I'll show you a better image here shortly. So those are the two construction oriented projects I've highlighted in yellow. So just know that EIS is not just one project, but in fact four. So this is a conceptual image of what those tea head groins could look like in the Holly Kalani beach cell. Um, two, uh, three tea head groins, an L spur groin on either end. So five new structures altogether. There's been a lot of, um, thought and discussion around how these structures will perform, what will their impact be to the environment, particularly things like surf sites, that, that type of thing. 
Um, just know that there's a lot of thought that has gone into this uh, in these designs. So that's the area that we're talking about. Um, another conceptual image, a oblique image of what these um, T head groins could look like. Keep in mind, they're not meant to just trap sand that might be passing by. They're intentionally designed <clears throat> to be filled with sand. So we have to find a source of sand, which there has been a couple identified offshore of the um, Hilton area that could be a source of sand for this proposed beach. Uh, if you contrast this image with what it looks like now, which is essentially wet sea walls, um, this would be a, a, a bit different than our current practice, which is to maintain beaches in their current configuration. Throughout Waikiki, the plan really is just, let's maintain the beach how it looks now. We don't have to get crazy with building a huge beach. This project is a little different in that it proposes to build a beach where there never was one, at least not this large. So that's why I refer to it as an ambitious project in that way. Uh, the full build out for this, all the T head groins is probably closer to 50 or 60 million. Uh, we don't have the budget for that. So the plan right now is just to do the first phase, this ever most portion, just the two structures uh, with that maybe 16 to $18 million that um, might be available in the state budget. So just those two structures there. Uh, if you're familiar with this area, the, the hotel uh, adjacent to this is the Outrigger Reef. And if you've been to that area recently, it looks terrible. The beach is essentially gone. There's all kinds of old infrastructures, pipes, old rebar, concrete. There's all kinds of, the beach is a mess. I can assure you that. Uh, so there's, strong interest in doing something here to stabilize that area. Um, so a little bit of the details there, one T head groin, one elk groin, 20,000 cubic yards of sand. Um, it turns out the sand is the most expensive portion of this project. The rocks are not the most expensive, the sand is, uh, because it's so complicated to get sand from offshore. We're, and this is kind of the fun part of my job is exploring alternatives. And one of the things we're looking at is a smaller scale dredge type system rather than a big barge with a crane that has to pump sediment long distances. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of a pilot project in this area that could put sand on the beach in um, a more frequent, smaller scale manner that could be mounted even on a small boat, something a small vessel that could get in over the reef and possibly even um, use the sand that's in the Hale Kalani or Kavehi channel um, as a sand recycling type project. So this is just an idea at this point. There are no plans to do this yet, but there is interest in doing something that might supplement uh, that phase one of the tea head groin project that I showed you earlier. This would be an innovative new approach to scale everything down that could be used elsewhere as well. Uh, we have a lot of stream mouths around the state that need to be cleared, as well as small harbors and things like that, that sometimes it's difficult to get heavy equipment in there. <clears throat> okay, so transitioning away from Waikiki projects on the beach, I wanted to provide some context to some of the policies that are driving uh, the conversations around what to do in Waikiki. One of those is the Honolulu has a climate commission, if you're not already aware of that. They just recently produced and updated uh, some guidance on sea level rise. Uh, they're suggesting that the city and county of Honolulu plan for the um, interagency projection for intermediate sea level rise of 3.8 feet by the year 2100. And if it's a critical project, critical infrastructure, or anything that really can't get wet, um, to plan for up to 5.8 feet. So let's just round those off to four and six feet for ease and um, looking at things like the interagency projections into the future. It's not just the year 2100 100 that we're planning for. We're, we're also looking at those intermediate timeframes <clears throat> for how what we, what we should be planning for for a beach that might last 25 to 30 years. So all of this information is critically important for how we develop plans for Waikiki Beach, and where, where we're gonna be able to manage beaches or maintain beaches and maybe places where we may not be able to maintain beaches. There's also uh, a statewide effort back in 2017 to map sea level rise around the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, this is another piece of really 
useful information that is used for some of our planning and not just Waikiki, but it's used statewide to justify um, making plans that incorporate sea level rise projections into those plans. And then of course, that map of sea level rise in Waikiki is one of those we keep coming back to. I showed this twice now intentionally because I wanna highlight the fact that this is the type of information that is driving the conversations uh, in Waikiki, especially. And um, I can share with you an interesting story about that. It used to be that uh, many of us in this room even were very defensive of the science behind climate change, sea level rise. Yes, it's real. Yes, it's because of human activities. And here's what it looks like. And up until even five years ago, um, the typical answer I would get from many people in Waikiki is, okay, we get it, but let's wait and see. That conversation has completely changed in my experience. In Waikiki, business owners, landowners are well beyond that and now asking what can we do what should we be doing what should we be thinking about so <clears throat> i'm happy to say that because it's now um, at the forefront of everybody's thought people are begging for adaptation strategies what does adaptation look like and i'll, I'll show you some of those here shortly <clears throat> uh, but it's not just about sea level rise it's about groundwater inundation as well which is driven by sea level rise so it's not just the ocean coming at us over land, but it's the groundwater table bubbling right up through the surface of the land. Uh, this is an image from um, Shelley Habel looking at the impacts of sea level rise on the groundwater table and which areas will that saturated zone become wet. So just know that it's not just Waikiki. Um, this is a statewide problem and it's, it really impacts our entire urban core of Honolulu. So it, it's a problem that is going to be need, need to be dealt with um, in a holistic and comprehensive way. We've also, as a Sea Grant program here, been providing guidance on what does adaptation look like? What is the science telling us? I'm not going to go into each of these documents, but just know that there is a lot of information available that goes beyond the science, but starts to dive into how do we incorporate the science into our plans and policies statewide. So this is the type of thing that we've been working in partnership with our local government on developing um, plans for how to use that information so it's effective in adaptation. And we're not alone. Uh, know that we're paying very, there's a whole group of us paying very close attention to what other people are doing, whether states are doing and what other countries are doing in their adaptation strategies. So there's a lot to learn from others. Uh, some of those that jump out at me that I think can serve as really great examples for what we might start to think about here in Hawaii are Boston and New York, and of course, Miami, which we share a very similar geology and geography. Um, there's things happening in those locations that we're paying very close attention to to see if they're working and how well they're working, <clears throat> what type of frameworks are needed to implement them. So it starts to dive, starts to get into the policy side of management, using the science uh, for planning and policy. So what does the future of urban Honolulu look like? Well, some of those things that we're paying attention to, we can start to fine tune for Waikiki specifically. Um, here's an image that was proposed for Miami of elevated roadways. Some of you may have seen images like this before. Um, this used to be kind of like a shocking image for people to think of elevated roads in Waikiki. And now people are really talking about like, well, okay, where would we do that? And how high would it be? And, you know, is it the first floor? <laughs> those kind of conversations. So people are very interested in seeing what it can look like, that, those adaptation um, designs like this. Uh, there's the Big U in New York that serves as an example of a storm mitigation uh, project for Southern Manhattan to mitigate storm, uh, hurricane storm surge, but it also serves as a public resource, as an open park area. So there's those kind of elements that we're looking at is how do you, build something that can mitigate uh, flooding, but also serve as a resource for other uses. 
I'm happy to say that Waikiki is now, um, we're embarking on a resilience plan for Waikiki. <clears throat> this is um, with funding from the state legislature that's going through the state office of planning uh, into the uh, School of Architecture has a community design center. So it's an architect, uh, architecturally based center to start to develop um, design charrettes for what Waikiki could look like. The ultimate goal here is to have an interdisciplinary team in an effort to look at what are the vulnerabilities to Waikiki for climate change in particular. We have a pretty good understanding of what that looks like. Um, the ultimate goal being let's develop a strategy and a plan for adapting Waikiki. The first step, of course, is to start to develop conceptual designs and models of what that could look like. So we're just kicking this off now, like literally last month it just started. So you're going to hear a lot more about the resilience plan for Waikiki, but just know it's meant to serve as a demonstration project for the state of how to do a plan, what kind of partnerships can form around that. Some of those other design charrettes include envisioning sea level rise in Waikiki, and this is um, with one of our colleagues, Wendy McGurro, uh, Chip Fletcher was also involved with this, as well as um, a, um, an army of graduate students from the School of Architecture, among others. Uh, and that looks at what, is, what are some of the vulnerabilities in Waikiki and what are some of the site-specific design interventions that can be done and conducted in those areas. Um, and you can broadly categorize those as protect, accommodate, or avoid. Those are really common adaptation terms that are used. Um, historical practice in Hawaii has been to protect build seawalls, build revetments, build things to stop and mitigate whatever it is that's happening in the flood. There's other elements. Um, we're gonna, for this particular project, we're more focused on adaptation. So the accommodation portion of that. And there's a whole suite of things that could be done in Waikiki, elevating buildings, uh, dry flood proofing, wet flood proofing. Um, you can accommodate water in a variety of ways, depending on the type of structure, type of building that you're, you have. Some older buildings can't really accommodate water very well. Um, other, others can. So it just depends on the building typology as well. This is why architects are re really well suited for thinking about these things is because they understand the design and architecture behind it. There are other um, incentives that could be used to incentivize people to perhaps repurpose their ground floor as a floodable area by giving them credit to build one more story higher, things like that. Um, you can incentivize some of the adaptation measures. So we talk about this in this uh, effort for Waikiki, what some of those um, designs might look like. We talk a lot about what the sea level rise projections look like on the ground. I don't know if you can see it in your images here, but uh, the the photos on the right illustrate those blue lines illustrate um, design flood elevations based on sea level rise projections. And you can see uh, there's an ABC store there that really needs to think about um, flooding and uh, adapting to sea level rise in the future. And there's a variety of ways that you can, re you can do that. The first of which, the most obvious of which is relocate your critical infrastructure generators, electrical, all that kind of stuff needs to get up um, an entire floor if possible. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at for Waikiki. Um, we're also looking at things like design flood elevations and making guidelines around that of what, what should we be designing for based on sea level rise. And this is just my attempt um, to categorize this. This is not published or even in the works, but one idea would be to categorize the types of buildings in Waikiki. So are you, are you uh, a high rise hotel or are you a small two-story walk-up? Different types of buildings might have different lifetimes associated design lifetimes and different design lifetimes might utilize different sea level rise projections depending on how long you think that structure will be there. So the, the take home here is Maybe one idea is to have a design flood elevation, which is above the minimum, anywhere from a foot and a half to five feet above what FEMA requires you build to in Waikiki currently. So this is just an example of the type of thinking that we're doing about how sea level rise will 
um, impact some of our communities in Waikiki. And this is just an illustration of what it could look like on the ground. Different types of buildings might have different design flood elevations associated with them. So it's not a one size fits all, far from it, in fact. So one of the other things that we're looking at for the Waikiki Resilience Plan is what type of information is needed. And I attempted to categorize that for the sake of um, discussion into technical, there's technical things that we need. And we have a lot of that already, vulnerability maps, sea level maps, hazard um, oriented maps. There's policy and management, which there's a lot underway currently. There's adaptation plans underway. We have beach and dune management plans. Um, there's a whole variety of things happening. And then there's the community side of it. And this is where Sea Grant Extension thrives, is that community engagement. That's a lot of what I do in Waikiki is talk to people, let them know what's happening, get feedback from them. There's socioeconomic impacts to some of these strategies as well. Are we gonna allow areas to flood? Are we gonna eventually retreat from some of these areas? Um, it's not a yes or no, but um, a probably a phase of different options that will have to occur over time. Okay, I'm changing gears now. <laughs> Are we out of time? Okay, 10 minutes, great, um, almost done. So I wanted to highlight some of the other efforts. Uh, my, um, in this case, we just recently produced a dune restoration manual. And this is a really great project. We've been working on um, developing this for a couple years now. Uh, this was targeting lay people and resorts and county municipal folks that are doing coastal dune restoration without even really knowing that they are or having an intentional um, purpose in doing so. We wanted to create a kind of a how-to manual for those people that are looking for softer alternatives and want to restore and maintain coastal dunes. Uh, we have in fact created um, a restoration manual. <clears throat> what type of plants go where and why, those kind of things, where to get more information. So just know that um, it's not just what I share with you in Waikiki is really engineering oriented. It's really more on the built environment we're also looking at softer measures to maintain coastal dunes. And this, this will help a lot with those that are interested in doing that. Uh, there's been a group of us also working on the North Shore of Oahu. And this is kind of the yin and yang of Waikiki and North Shore opposites in so many ways. Uh, we've worked closely with the Surfrider Foundation and SSFM on convening uh, six stakeholder meetings. So this was an invite stakeholder group of North Shore um, residents and North Shore representatives, elected officials, so forth, to talk about what can we do to adapt the North Shore to uh, climate change and what can we do right now in the short term even to address some of the erosion issues. Uh, so this was our team, or at least some portion of our team here that we met on the beach in one of our field trips. And through this report that was produced, um, we were able to identify a few things of critical concern. I won't go through all of these. Um, I won't read all of these to you because lack of time, but just know that we were able to identify uh, seven or six critical concerns. These are all identified <clears throat> and discussed in more detail in the report. Uh, none of these should surprise you. You've seen all this before about erosion impacts to homes and highways. We were also able to develop um, strategies and recommendations for action. So this was probably the, the more important portion of the report, in my opinion, is where do we go from here? What type of, um, what should we be doing on the North Shore? And there was a lot of discussion about uh, and concern with the stakeholder group about a lack of a cohesive plan for the North Shore. I mentioned Waikiki has a beach management plan. The North Shore does not. And so that is low hanging fruit, I think, uh, in my mind, when many people would agree that we should probably develop a management plan for how we manage the North Shore, one of our um, most important beach assets um, on that side of the island. Uh, some of the policy and framework for adaptation we developed in the report um, talks a lot about education and outreach to stakeholders and the community. 
the community is really interested and engaged uh, for obvious reason on the North Shore. They, they value the beaches there. It's part of the culture. It's part of the um, history there. And so there's a lot of interest in how to better manage and maintain that. We also talked a lot about managed retreat in this report and how we might um, develop a strategy for managed retreat for portions of the North Shore. And it's not that you would retreat from the coast everywhere all at once. You have to identify priority areas. Uh, and here I share with you some of the triggers that could be used for managed retreat. Uh, things like beach width and erosion rates and erosion um, thresholds. Uh, coastal inundation frequency and magnitude. So how often is the highway overtopped? Right now it's a couple few times a year, but that's gonna occur in increasing frequency in the future. There's economic costs that can be triggers. There's an example from Santa Cruz, California that they decided once they spend a certain amount, I can't remember what it was, but certain millions of dollars on mitigating the erosion, they were just gonna stop and then relocate the highway. And they figured that would be cheaper. And then infrastructure damage. Uh, for the area at Sunset Beach, Camis, where the, you know, there's this ongoing erosion threat, I think we've blown through most of these triggers already. And that would be nice if we could say, okay, in five years, we're gonna do this. And in 10 years, we're gonna do that. I'm not sure we have that much time there. So we're, we're really kind of in more of a forced retreat situation in that particular location. So with that, I'll stop for some questions. Sure. Uh, we're pretty close to the hour. What I suggest is that we can take one question from the room. And there's questions online also. So I want to get to at least a couple of those. Um, let's take one from the room. I want to sure. get a couple of announcements in before we get to the hour. I don't think we'll like to run out of classes. And there's class. And we're and there's uh, in the back, too. Um, so, folks are welcome to stick around a little longer. If you don't mind, don't. No, I can hang out. Sure. Those questions. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, but if folks need to run to, feel free to make it no problem. Uh, so, one question from the room to start. Anybody got it? Sure. Yeah. We saw upgraded subsidy to a high school as the end of the school trailer. That project, for like the scope of that project, is there also going to be a portion where you're looking at how it's affecting sedimentation on the reefs and whether it's improving that since you're moving it more locally? So yeah, I think you're referring to that small scale dredge yeah. system. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a name for it yet because it, yeah. it's an idea. Um, <laughs> there are there is equipment out there that could be put together to do that project. It, I mentioned it would be innovative because of that. Like nobody's really done that yet. Okay. Um, but yes, in order to get the permits to do any work like that, it has to go through a full uh, review through the state and the Department of Health and among others. Um, it would trigger all kinds of permitting that those questions would have to be addressed is what is the environmental impact of doing that and the placement of the sand, where is it gonna go? Water quality is an important component. So the short answer is yes, all those would have to be um, addressed in various ways. Great, thanks Dylan. So I just wanna make one announcement before we go over to the sure. question. Again, folks are gonna go through. Uh, just stick around. Uh, so I just want to um, let folks know about our next Slice of Podcast seminar, which uh, will be Tuesday, um, first Tuesday of next month, April 4th at noon, as usual. Um, we'll be joined by Dr. Elliot Parsons and Dr. Glenn Dula, who will share with us on Pacific Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change for Pacific Risk Manage Management Network. So look out for announcements on that upcoming seminar. And, uh, email should be coming around, too. She will on that list, too, for the uh, sign up. Okay, so let's go um, to some of the online questions here. Sure. Uh, there was a couple from Nancy Person, but I'll just. You want to moderate some of those for me? Yeah, I'll read, I'll yeah. read it to you. Okay. Um, Nancy's asking uh, Has sand recycling had any impacts on surf spots and wave quality? Um, and maybe I can expand that question a little mm -hmm. bit from mine. Is, 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 um, we talk a lot about the beach and the landward side of, of the development, all that. Um, are you, how involved are you in looking at the, the reefs and, and offshore, the offshore uh, perspective? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So all, you know, these projects I shared with you are not without some impact. 
everything has an impact. The beach maintenance project that put the 21,000 cubic yards of sand on the beach, uh, some of that sand did migrate into the near shore. I think like the really shallow part knee deep area and it has filled in portions of that. Some think that's a good thing because it's not as reefy where you do the surf lessons. It's more sand bottom. Other people disagree and feel that it has changed the character of the waves there. So it, maybe it's not my place to say whether it's a good thing or not, um, but not everybody agrees that that's a good thing or a bad thing. The other more concerning element, I think, is where you dredge the sand from can have a big impact on how the waves approach the shoreline there and how they, more importantly, how they approach the surf sites. So in that last dredging effort, uh, the contractor dredged a really deep pit uh, in one location as opposed to moving it around like lawn, mowing the lawn style. There's pros and cons to doing that. Uh, when they dredged such a deep pit, it did appear to change the wave approach slightly to queens and canoes. However, so that's, I, I would agree with that. However, that pit filled in relatively quickly in a month or so. So that pit is no longer there and the waves should be approaching normally. Some people feel that the channel between canoes and queens has filled in with more sand. I haven't seen that myself. I swim and surf out there a lot. I haven't noticed that, but um, some people feel that the character of the left at canoes is a little bit softer than normal because of the sand placement. Hard to say, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Is it because of the sand placement? Is it because we had an unusual winter? It could be a number of things. So um, there is that. But I, I can't, as a surfer myself, I can't say I've seen a huge dramatic change in the surf sites. Anything that would be of concern to me, like, oh, we just destroyed that wave. Nothing like that. Um, what was the other part that you added something to that question? Oh, I was wondering about the, um, the reefs. The reefs oh, the reefs, like yes. Of course. Um, yeah. And so the reefs are of, I mean, reefs are critically important to Waikiki. There's no question. There's a lot of interest in how to maintain and protect the reefs in Waikiki. How you do that is subject to discussion. And there's growing interest on developing projects. So there really aren't any projects in Waikiki to restore or maintain the reef in any significant way. There's ideas and proposed projects that are underway, but they're not underway, they're proposed. Uh, and some of those include things like growing native corals on frames in Waikiki that can then be used to seed the reef and try to restore the reef. So there's a lot of interest in that. Um, this ties in with that World Surf Reserve idea if we develop a stewardship plan that says we think some of the biggest threats to the surf sites could be, you know, water quality, water chemistry, and sand, then we could find ways to develop strategies to address that. I'm not suggesting we're going to magically make a new surf wave with coral reefs, but if we can better protect the reefs that are there, that's in everybody's interest, and there's, there is a lot of interest in doing that, so stay tuned for more on that. Um, I can't point to a particular project yet, but in a couple of years, I think we're gonna have a couple of projects that we can point to. Thanks, Dylan. I just wanna um, comment in the, uh, the chat here. Um, Kirsten Moy says, uh, thanks for all the great info. Um, DAR, the Department of Aquatic Resources State and uh, HCRI, I don't know that acronym, so we'll officially be in touch soon um, regarding the White Coal Reef Initiative. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. we'll be in touch soon uh, regarding reef restoration statewide. So it sounds like- great. Uh, Yep, I know there are, there are some reef restoration efforts that are being developed, and I'm hopeful that the university can play an important role in helping develop those too. If I can, I want to put one other plug in that was uh, in the chat from Lisa Serpent. Um, our next Sea Grant Voice the Sea episode is about marine debris and mechanized beach cleaning. That's not the topic came up. Oh, so, great. Uh, Voice the Sea dot org more info on that. So, uh, Okay, uh, other questions in the room? Kind of a two prong question. Um, both have to do with different islands. Uh, first, sea level rise, I understand it's different, varies according to the island. At least it has interest in cohesively across all of them. That's right. Is there one island in particular that seems to be most at threat? 
And then following up on that, a lot of the planning that I've seen is focused on a lot of that a county driven thing, or is that just population based, or are the other islands yeah, too threatened based on that sea level rise? That's that's good, good question. Two really good questions. Um, so the sea level rise question is really important in that you're right, each island is a little different and it's based on um, the uplift or subsidence of the island itself. So you can think of theoretically Kauai and Oahu are kind of slowly rising or at least not sinking as fast, some might argue. Big Island and Maui are slowly sinking because of their relatively new age. Um, so each island has a different relative sea level rise rate and um, that needs to be incorporated into some of the plans. Uh, for example, what's the most at risk? Well, probably the Hilo side of the Big Island is sinking the fastest, in addition to sea level rise on top of that. So it's not just sea level, but we refer to that as relative sea level. The land is also moving in some places up or down. Um, so um, let's see, we have sea level rise. The, your question about the emphasis on Oahu, that's actually an interesting question. There are other, I didn't talk about it here today. There are a number of other adaptation oriented efforts statewide. Kauai has got some really ambitious um, um, pr um, projects to adapt. They have maybe the, the most progressive shoreline setback in the nation that is relatively new. Actually, they're giving a, uh, the planning director for Kauai is giving a talk tomorrow uh, during lunchtime. Um, as part of the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience seminar. Uh, so we're going to hear from them on what they're doing. Maui's got some really good things going on, as, as do all the islands. Uh, I share with you some of the work I'm involved with since my focus is on Oahu. Um, but you're right, part of it is there is more focus on Oahu because the majority of the population is here from a funding standpoint as well. None of the islands have a site-specific resilience strategy. So that one I mentioned for Waikiki is the first in the state or will be. Uh, there are island-wide adaptation um, and resilience plans. Uh, I shouldn't say adaptation. There's an adaptation plan for Oahu underway, but it's not yet developed. There is a resilience strategy for the island of Oahu um, that is complete, but it's not a site-specific for a like Waikiki. So Waikiki could be a really important pilot for the rest of the state to look at and see what worked and what didn't work. Was there another question? I think that was it, right? Okay. We touched on the topics I see in the chat. Is there one more question? I'm happy to stick around too if you want to chat after. I have one more, but <laughs> um, a lot of the adaptation seems like we're pushing against like critical need versus the bureaucracy kind of. Yeah, that that is it can be a problem. So, um, I think in the in there is an implementation challenge to a lot of this. I think is what you're getting to is like how do we do this and how do we get out of our own way to do some of those things. Um, there are going to be certain um, drivers that are going to accelerate certain types of projects. I mentioned the North Shore is, you know, arguably in an unmanaged retreat or a forced retreat situation, um, as opposed to like having a plan for slowly stepping back from the shoreline. We're kind of being forced to do it now, right? Like people aren't ready, but it's, it's now at the doorstep um, for some of those um, homeowners. But there's also, um, there's also maybe the momentum to just stay in place and try to adapt and you know, build a dune, those kind of things. So I'm not sure that I have an answer to your question about are, are we gonna be able to resolve that from a bureaucratic standpoint? I think yes, how we do that is gonna be really important though. And one of those things that comes up more and more of this idea of managed retreat is is it equitable? Are, are, you know, are tax dollars being used to buy out wealthy beachfront landowners? Um, is that fair? That's one, I don't necessarily um, agree with that position, but that's something I hear a lot. Like, why should we use our money to buy out rich people? 
I think of it in terms of we're not buying out rich people, but we're preserving the beach. We're buying ourselves the beach, right? So there's those kind of equity issues that play out as well. Um, but there's there's more and more attention being paid to um, how we're going to develop these strategies. There's a lot of planning that's underway now to really take a look at adaptation pathways. So I mentioned, you know, that there's this idea of managed retreat, and then there's this idea of uh, protect in place. Keep everything like Waikiki right now. It's like protect and accommodate. Keep it where it is. Other rural communities might be more on the managed retreat side, but there's a whole suite of tools in between that we're not really talking about yet. I shared some of those today, uh, but the conversations that you hear in the media are build seawalls or move the highway. Uh, those are two endpoints, sure, and those are two really important ones, but there, there's a lot that can be done in between. That's where the implementation um, strategies come in and those triggers for when you would do those things are uh, important to have some idea of, is this a five-year project or a 25-year project? So I don't know if I really answered your question, but we talk around it a little bit. Okay, we better wrap it up. So I mean, thank you for going in.